The forest was always my sanctuary. The dense trees, the crunch of leaves underfoot, and the crisp air filled my lungs with a sense of peace I couldn't find anywhere else. My name is Hank Mercer, and I was a cryptid hunter, more a passion than a profession, but one I pursued with relentless dedication. Back in the late 80s, the world wasn't obsessed with viral videos or online fame. Instead, stories were passed down, whispers in the night, and if you wanted to make a name for yourself in my field, you had to find proof, tangible, undeniable proof. I lived in a small town nestled in the Appalachian foothills, a place where everybody knew everybody, and rumors spread like wildfire. It was in one of those smoke-filled bars that I first heard about the Devil's Hollow. An old man, hunched over a whiskey glass, muttered about a place deep in the forest where people disappeared, never to return. He spoke of strange lights, unsettling noises, and shadows that didn't belong. Naturally, I was intrigued. I had spent years chasing stories like this, most of them leading to dead ends or misidentifications of common wildlife. But something about the old man's tale stuck with me. It wasn't just the way he spoke, but the look in his eyes, pure, unfiltered fear. I decided to prepare for an expedition. Over the next few weeks, I gathered my gear, a sturdy tent, ample supplies, and my trusty camera. I also packed a revolver, never been much of a gun guy, but there were wild animals out there, and one couldn't be too careful. My best friend Jake insisted on coming along. Jake was the only person who truly understood my obsession, having joined me on countless hunts before. He was a big guy with a bigger heart, and his presence was always comforting. We set off early one autumn morning, the fog hanging low over the ground like a ghostly blanket. As we ventured deeper into the forest, the trees seemed to close in around us, their branches intertwining like skeletal fingers. The air grew colder, and an eerie silence enveloped us, broken only by the occasional rustle of leaves or distant call of a bird. After a full day's hike, we set up camp in a small clearing. The sun was beginning to set, casting long shadows that danced around us. As we sat by the fire, Jake and I discussed the old man's story in detail. The tale of the Devil's Hollow had many versions, but the most consistent element was the disappearances. Over the past few decades, several people had vanished without a trace. Some were hunters, others were hikers but all of them were experienced outdoorsmen who should have known how to survive in the wild. That night, as we lay in our tent, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. It was an irrational thought, I told myself, a product of our campfire conversation and the natural creepiness of the forest at night. Still, I found it hard to sleep. The sounds of the forest, usually so familiar and comforting, now seemed sinister and threatening. The next day, we ventured further into the forest. The old man's directions were vague at best, but we followed the landmarks he mentioned. A crooked tree that looked like a witch's finger, a stream that ran red with iron, and finally a large rock formation that resembled a crouching beast. By mid-afternoon, we reached a dense thicket that seemed to swallow all light. This, I was sure, was the edge of the Devil's Hollow. Pushing through the undergrowth, we entered a clearing that felt wrong in every sense of the word. The air was heavy, oppressive, and the silence was deafening. No birds, no insects, nothing. It was as if we had stepped into another world, one that was fundamentally hostile to human presence. As we explored the clearing, Jake called out to me. He had found something, a crude makeshift campsite, the remnants of a fire pit, some scattered belongings, and most chillingly, a backpack with a name tag, Sam Carter. Sam was a local who had disappeared about a year ago. Finding his belongings here confirmed that we were in the right place, but it also filled me with a sense of dread. If Sam had been here, where was he now? We decided to set up camp in the clearing, hoping to find more clues the next day. As night fell, the atmosphere grew even more oppressive. The fire seemed to struggle against the darkness, its light barely penetrating the gloom. We ate in silence, both of us on edge, our ears straining for any sound that might indicate danger. It was around midnight when we heard it, a low, almost imperceptible hum. It seemed to come from all directions at once, making it impossible to pinpoint the source. 
The sound grew louder, more insistent, and I felt a strange vibration in the ground beneath me. Jake and I exchanged a worried glance, and without a word we grabbed our flashlights and weapons. We ventured to the edge of the clearing, where the trees formed an almost impenetrable wall. The humming was louder here, a deep, resonant thrum that seemed to vibrate in my bones. I shone my flashlight into the trees, and for a moment I thought I saw something move. A shadow, darker than the surrounding darkness, slipping through the trees. Did you see that? Jake whispered, his voice barely audible over the hum. I nodded, my heart pounding in my chest. We stood there straining to see into the darkness when suddenly the humming stopped. The silence that followed was so complete, so absolute, that it felt like a physical weight pressing down on us. And then we heard the scream. It was a high-pitched, keening wail that seemed to come from everywhere and nowhere. It was a sound of pure, unadulterated terror, and it sent chills down my spine. Jake and I turned and ran back to the camp, our flashlights bobbing wildly in the darkness. We spent the rest of the night huddled by the fire, our nerves stretched to the breaking point. Neither of us spoke, each lost in our own thoughts. I kept replaying the events in my mind, trying to make sense of what we had seen and heard. But no matter how I turned it over, I couldn't come up with a rational explanation. The next morning we were both exhausted but determined to continue our search. We packed up our gear and ventured deeper into the forest, following the direction from which the scream had come. The trees grew thicker, their branches forming a tangled canopy overhead that blocked out the sun. The air was cool and damp, and a faint mist hung in the air, giving everything a ghostly, otherworldly quality. We followed a narrow, winding path that seemed to lead us deeper and deeper into the heart of the forest. The humming sound had returned, faint but persistent, a constant background noise that set my teeth on edge. As we walked, we found more signs of human activity, discarded gear, broken branches, and once a tattered piece of clothing caught on a thorn bush. By late afternoon, we reached another clearing. This one was larger, with a small murky pond in the center. The water was still and dark, reflecting the overcast sky like a sheet of black glass. As we approached the pond, I noticed something strange. There were no animals, no birds, no insects. The forest around us was completely devoid of life. Jake and I stood at the edge of the pond, looking around for any signs of movement. Suddenly I noticed a figure standing on the opposite shore. It was a man, tall and thin, dressed in ragged clothes. His skin was pale, almost translucent, and his eyes glowed with an unnatural light. Who are you? I called out, my voice trembling slightly. The figure didn't respond. Instead, it began to walk slowly around the edge of the pond, moving with a strange, almost mechanical gait. As it got closer, I could see that its eyes weren't glowing. They were reflecting the light from our flashlights, like the eyes of a nocturnal animal. Jake raised his revolver, pointing it at the approaching figure. Stay back, he shouted. The figure stopped, tilting its head to one side as if considering us. Then, without warning, it lunged at us, moving with a speed and agility that was inhuman. Jake fired his gun, the sound echoing through the forest like a thunderclap. The figure staggered, but it didn't fall. Instead, it continued to advance, its eyes fixed on us with a malevolent intensity. We turned and ran, crashing through the underbrush in a blind panic. The humming sound had returned, louder and more insistent than ever, filling my ears and making it hard to think. We stumbled through the forest, our breath coming in ragged gasps, until we finally burst out into another clearing. This one was different. In the center stood a large, ancient-looking tree, its gnarled branches reaching up to the sky like skeletal fingers. At the base of the tree was a small, weathered stone altar, covered in strange symbols and carvings. The air around the tree was charged with an electric energy, making the hair on the back of my neck stand up. We had no choice but to make a stand. Jake and I positioned ourselves in front of the altar, our weapons at the ready. The figure emerged from the trees, moving with that same unnatural gait. It stopped a few feet away from us, its eyes glowing with an otherworldly light. For a moment, we just stood there, staring at each other. Then, without warning, the figure lunged at us again. This time I was ready. I raised my camera and snapped a picture, the flash momentarily blinding it. 
Jake fired his revolver, and this time the figure fell to the ground, motionless. We approached cautiously, our hearts pounding in our chests. The figure lay still, its eyes closed. Up close I could see that it wasn't a man at all. It was something else, something not of this world. Its skin was pale and smooth, almost like porcelain, and its eyes were large and almond-shaped, reflecting the light in a way that was unnervingly familiar. As we stood there, catching our breath, the humming sound began to fade. The forest around us seemed to come alive again, the sounds of birds and insects returning to fill the silence. We had survived, but I knew that our ordeal was far from over. We buried the figure at the base of the tree, covering it with stones to ensure it wouldn't rise again. Then we made our way back to our camp, our minds reeling from the events of the past two days. We packed up our gear and began the long trek back to civilization, our steps heavy with exhaustion. When we finally emerged from the forest, we were greeted by the sight of the old man from the bar. He was standing at the edge of the trees, a knowing look in his eyes. He didn't say a word, but I could tell that he understood what we had been through. Jake and I returned to town, but things were never the same. The events of that night had changed us, leaving us with a deep sense of unease and a lingering fear that something was still out there, lurking in the shadows. We never spoke of the Devil's Hollow again, but the memory of that place haunted us for the rest of our lives. As for me, I gave up cryptid hunting. The thrill of the chase had been replaced by a profound sense of dread. I realized that some mysteries are better left unsolved, some places better left unexplored. The forest had been my sanctuary, but now it was a place of nightmares, a reminder that the world is full of things we cannot understand, things that defy explanation. Years later, I still find myself thinking about the Devil's Hollow. I wonder how many more people have disappeared into its depths, how many more souls have been lost to its malevolent embrace. The old man is long gone, and the bar where I first heard his story has been replaced by a strip mall. But the forest remains, dark and impenetrable, a silent witness to the horrors that lie within. And so, I tell my story, not as a warning, but as a testament to the unknown. The world is full of mysteries, some of which are better left unsolved. The Devil's Hollow is one of those mysteries, a place where reality and nightmare intersect, where the line between the known and the unknown blurs into nothingness. And though I survive to tell the tale, a part of me will always remain in that dark, haunted forest, lost to the shadows forever. I still remember the cool autumn air the day we set out on what would be our last search. The sun was just beginning to peek over the horizon, casting a golden hue over the dense forest. We were a motley crew of cryptid hunters, each of us with our own reasons for being there. Me? I was in it for the stories. I had heard tales of strange creatures and unexplained disappearances all my life, and I wanted to see for myself if there was any truth to them. Our target was an elusive creature known only in whispers and old newspaper clippings. They called it the Silverwood Stalker, a name that sent shivers down the spines of even the most seasoned hunters. Rumors of its existence dated back to the early 1900s, but sightings had been sparse and unreliable. Still, the recent disappearance of a young girl named Emily had reignited interest in the Stalker. Her parents were desperate for answers, and we were determined to find them. We had assembled at the edge of the forest, just outside a small, nearly forgotten town that thrived on lumber and the occasional tourist. Our team leader, Jackson, was a burly man with a grizzled beard and a no-nonsense attitude. He had been hunting cryptids for over twenty years and had the scars to prove it. Then there was Maria, a sharp-witted researcher with a knack for finding patterns in chaos. She had pored over every piece of data related to the stalker and was convinced we were on the right track. Finally, there was me, a writer with more curiosity than sense, and Thomas, our cameraman, whose quiet demeanor belied his skill with a lens. As we entered the forest, the trees closed in around us, their branches intertwining to form a canopy that blocked out much of the sunlight. The air was thick with the scent of pine and damp earth, and the only sounds were the crunch of leaves beneath our boots and the distant call of birds. 
Stay close, Jackson barked, his voice a low rumble. This place has a way of messing with your head. We nodded, tightening our grips on our equipment. I had a notepad and a flashlight, while Thomas carried his camera, always at the ready to capture any evidence. Maria clutched a GPS device, her eyes scanning the screen for any anomalies. For hours we trudged through the underbrush, following Maria's directions and Jackson's instincts. The deeper we went, the more oppressive the forest seemed. The trees grew thicker, their trunks gnarled and twisted as if they were trying to keep us out. It wasn't long before we stumbled upon the first sign that something was amiss. It was a clearing, eerily silent and devoid of any animal life. In the center stood a lone tree, its bark stripped away in large, jagged patches. Claw marks, deep and deliberate, marred its surface. Jackson knelt down, inspecting the ground around the tree. Tracks, he muttered, pointing to a set of footprints that led deeper into the forest. They were unlike any I'd ever seen, elongated and misshapen, as if made by something not entirely human. We followed the tracks, our nerves on edge. The forest seemed to grow darker, the air colder. Every snap of a twig, every rustle of leaves sent our hearts racing. It was as if the forest itself was alive, watching us, waiting. Hours turned into days, and our supplies began to dwindle. The forest played tricks on us, distorting our sense of time and direction. We became jumpy, snapping at each other over the smallest things. But none of us wanted to admit we were scared. Not yet. It was on the third night that things took a turn for the worse. We had set up camp in a small clearing, our tents huddled close together. A fire crackled in the center, casting flickering shadows on the trees. We were eating a meager dinner when we heard it, a low, guttural noise that sent chills down our spines. What the hell was that? Thomas whispered, his eyes wide with fear. Jackson stood, his hand on the hilt of his hunting knife. Stay close to the fire he ordered, scanning the darkness. The noise came again, louder this time, closer. It was a sound unlike anything I'd ever heard, a mix of a growl and a hiss, like metal scraping against metal. My heart pounded in my chest as I clutched my flashlight, its beam cutting through the darkness. Then we saw it. A figure, just at the edge of the firelight, its eyes glowing with an unnatural light. It was tall, impossibly tall, its limbs long and sinewy. It moved with a fluid grace, like a predator stalking its prey. For a moment none of us moved, paralyzed by fear. Then Jackson shouted, Run! We scattered, fleeing into the forest. I ran blindly, branches whipping at my face, my breath coming in ragged gasps. Behind me I could hear the others, their footsteps mingling with the creature's relentless pursuit. I don't know how long I ran, but eventually I stumbled and fell, my flashlight skidding out of my hand. I scrambled to my feet, my eyes darting around the darkness. I was alone. The realization hit me like a punch to the gut. Jackson, Maria, Thomas, I called out, my voice echoing through the trees. But there was no response, only the eerie silence of the forest. Panic set in, and I began to walk, my legs trembling with exhaustion. I had to find the others, had to get out of this nightmare. But no matter how far I walked, the forest remained the same, an endless maze of trees and shadows. Hours passed. Or maybe it was days. Time had lost all meaning. I was on the verge of collapse when I saw a light in the distance. Hope surged through me and I stumbled towards it, my legs barely able to support my weight. The light led me to a cabin, its windows glowing with a warm, inviting light. I didn't stop to think didn't question how a cabin could be in the middle of nowhere. I just needed to be inside, to be safe. I burst through the door, collapsing onto the floor. The warmth of the fire washed over me, and for a moment I felt safe. Then I looked up and froze. The cabin was empty, but it was clear that someone, or something, had been there. The furniture was old and worn, covered in a thick layer of dust. Strange symbols were carved into the walls, their meaning unknown but it was the smell that hit me the hardest, a sickly sweet odor that turned my stomach. I struggled to my feet, my mind racing. I had to get out of there, had to find the others. But as I turned to leave, the door slammed shut, trapping me inside. 
Panic set in, and I banged on the door, screaming for help. But there was no response, only the silence of the cabin. I was trapped, alone, with whatever had been following us. Hours passed, and I sat huddled by the fire, my mind racing. I tried to make sense of everything, tried to understand what had happened. But no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. Then I heard it the same guttural noise that had haunted us in the forest. It was closer now, just outside the cabin. My heart raced, and I pressed myself against the wall, my eyes darting around the room. The noise grew louder, more insistent. Then with a crash, the door burst open, and the creature stepped inside. It was even more terrifying up close, its eyes glowing with a malevolent light. It moved towards me, its limbs elongated and twisted. I backed away, my heart pounding in my chest. Stay back, I shouted, but my voice was weak, trembling with fear. The creature didn't stop, its eyes fixed on me. I could see its teeth now, sharp and jagged like shards of glass. It was hungry, and I was its prey. In a desperate bid for survival, I grabbed a piece of wood from the fire, brandishing it like a weapon. The creature hesitated, its eyes narrowing. Then, with a sudden, fluid movement, it lunged at me. I swung the wood, hitting it square in the face. The creature let out a shriek of pain, its eyes blazing with fury. But it didn't retreat. It came at me again, its claws slashing through the air. I fought with everything I had, but it was no use. The creature was too strong, too fast. It knocked the wood from my hand, pinning me against the wall. I could feel its breath on my face, hot and rancid. Its eyes bored into mine, and for a moment I thought it was all over. Then, with a sudden burst of strength, I kicked out, hitting it in the chest. The creature stumbled back, giving me just enough time to scramble to my feet. I grabbed the wood again, swinging it with all my might. This time I aimed for its head, and with a sickening crunch I connected. The creature let out a final, agonizing scream before collapsing to the floor. I stood there, panting, my heart racing. It was over. The creature was dead. But I wasn't safe yet. I had to find the others, had to get out of that cursed forest. I stumbled out of the cabin, my legs trembling with exhaustion. The forest seemed to close in around me, its shadows long and menacing. I walked for what felt like hours, my mind numb with fear and exhaustion. Then, just as I was about to give up, I heard a voice. Over here! It was Jackson, his voice weak but unmistakable. I followed the sound, my heart pounding in my chest. When I finally found him, he was leaning against a tree, his face pale and gaunt. Thank God, he muttered, his eyes filled with relief. I thought I was the only one. We sat there for a moment, catching our breath. Then, slowly, we began to piece together what had happened. The others were gone, lost to the forest or the creature. We were the only survivors. With no supplies and little hope, we began our trek out of the forest. It was slow going, our bodies weak and battered, but we kept moving, driven by the need to survive. Days later, we stumbled out of the forest and into the small town. The locals looked at us with a mix of pity and fear, their eyes filled with unspoken questions. We didn't have the answers, didn't know how to explain what had happened. All we knew was that we had survived. As we sat in the town's small diner, sipping on hot coffee, Jackson turned to me. You going to write about this? He asked, his voice rough. I nodded. Yeah, people need to know. And so I did. I wrote about the creature, the forest, and the horrors we faced. But even as I put pen to paper, I knew that no words could truly capture the fear and desperation we felt. It was something that would stay with us forever, a dark stain on our souls. Years have passed since that fateful expedition, and the forest has reclaimed its secrets. The locals still tell stories of the Silverwood Stalker, their voices hushed and fearful. But few believe the tales, dismissing them as mere legends. But I know the truth. I've seen the creature, felt its breath on my face. And I know that somewhere, deep in the heart of the forest, it still lurks, waiting for its next victim. So if you ever find yourself near Silverwood, remember this. Stay out of the forest, because once you're in, you might never come out.
I still remember the call that came in on a chilly October morning back in 1995. I was sipping my usual cup of black coffee at the old diner on Main Street when my pager buzzed. As a cryptid hunter, I wasn't exactly the first person you'd call for a missing persons case, but this one was different. The sheriff's department knew about my knack for the strange and unexplainable. I arrived at the sheriff's office, the wooden floors creaking under my boots. Sheriff Dale greeted me with a grim look, his usual jovial demeanor replaced by something much darker. Got something for you, Jack? he said, handing me a manila folder. Inside were photographs of a young boy, no more than ten, with the name Tommy Hargrove written underneath. The last known sighting was near an old abandoned cabin deep in Whispering Pines, a forest notorious for its eerie tales and mysterious disappearances. Sheriff Dale sighed, rubbing his temples. Locals say the place is cursed. We usually dismiss it as superstitious nonsense, but with Tommy missing I can't ignore it. Thought you might have some insights. I nodded, feeling the weight of the task ahead. Whispering Pines had always intrigued and unsettled me. Stories of strange creatures and unexplainable occurrences had been whispered about for generations. I packed my gear, double-checked my flashlight, and headed out, a sense of foreboding settling in my gut. The drive to Whispering Pines was uneventful, the narrow road winding through dense woods that seemed to close in around me the further I went. By the time I reached the edge of the forest, the sun was beginning to dip below the horizon, casting long, ominous shadows across the landscape. I parked my truck and took a deep breath, steeling myself for what lay ahead. The entrance to the forest was marked by an old wooden sign, half-rotted and barely legible. I pulled out my map and compass, ensuring I had my bearings before stepping into the woods. The air grew colder as I ventured deeper, the trees towering above like silent sentinels. The underbrush was thick, making progress slow and arduous. Every snap of a twig underfoot sounded unnaturally loud in the stillness. I kept my flashlight handy, knowing that darkness would fall quickly in these parts. About an hour in, I stumbled upon the first sign of life, or what used to be life. A deer carcass lay in a small clearing, its body torn apart as if by some savage animal. I examined the wounds, noting the deep gashes and missing organs. This wasn't the work of a common predator. Something much more vicious had done this. I pressed on, my senses on high alert. The further I went, the more the forest seemed to change. The trees grew thicker, their branches intertwining above to create a canopy that blocked out the last of the fading light. A sense of unease settled over me, the silence oppressive. It was then that I heard it. A faint whispering, just on the edge of hearing. I couldn't make out the words, but it sent a shiver down my spine. I scanned the area with my flashlight, but saw nothing out of the ordinary. I decided to follow the sound, hoping it might lead me to some clue about Tommy's whereabouts. The whispering grew louder as I approached a small clearing, and there, standing in the center, was the old cabin. It looked exactly as the stories described, weathered wood, broken windows, and an air of malevolence that seemed to emanate from within. I approached cautiously, my flashlight cutting through the gloom. As I stepped onto the porch, the whispering stopped. The sudden silence was unnerving. I pushed open the door, its hinges creaking loudly. Inside the cabin was a mess of decayed furniture and scattered debris. The air was thick with the scent of mold and decay. I moved carefully, searching for any sign of Tommy. My flashlight beam caught something on the floor, small footprints leading towards a door at the back of the cabin. I followed them, my heart pounding in my chest. The door creaked open to reveal a set of stairs leading down into darkness. I hesitated for a moment, then steeled myself and descended. The air grew colder with each step, the darkness seeming to press in around me. At the bottom, I found myself in a small basement, the walls lined with old, rusty tools and rotting wood. And there, in the corner, huddled and trembling, was Tommy. I rushed over to him, but before I could reach him, the whispering started again, louder this time, more insistent. I turned, shining my flashlight around the room, and that's when I saw it. A figure, shrouded in shadow, standing at the far end of the basement. It was tall, unnaturally so, its limbs elongated and twisted, 
Its eyes glowed with a malevolent light, and as it moved towards me, I felt a wave of pure terror wash over me. I grabbed Tommy, pulling him behind me, and faced the creature. It moved with an unnatural grace, its movements almost hypnotic. I knew I couldn't fight it, not in the traditional sense. I had to rely on my wits and experience. I remembered an old trick an elder cryptid hunter had taught me. Sometimes, showing no fear could drive such entities away. I stood my ground, meeting its gaze head-on, refusing to let it see the terror that gripped my heart. For a moment it seemed to hesitate, its form flickering as if uncertain. The whispering grew louder, more frantic, and then, just as suddenly as it had appeared, the creature vanished, the whispering fading into nothingness. I wasted no time. Grabbing Tommy, I rushed up the stairs and out of the cabin, not stopping until we were well away from the clearing. Only then did I allow myself to breathe, the adrenaline still coursing through my veins. Tommy clung to me, his small body shaking with sobs. It's okay, kid, I murmured, holding him tight. You're safe now. We made our way back to my truck, the journey seeming to take twice as long in the dark. When we finally reached it, I radioed the sheriff, letting him know I had found Tommy and we were on our way back. The relief in his voice was palpable. As we drove back to town, Tommy began to talk, his voice barely above a whisper. He told me about the creature, how it had taken him while he was playing near the forest's edge, how it had whispered to him, telling him things that no child should ever hear. He spoke of others, too, voices that cried out for help, that begged for release. I listened, my heart heavy. This wasn't the first time I'd encountered such a being, and it likely wouldn't be the last. Whispering Pines had many secrets, and I had only scratched the surface. We arrived at the sheriff's office, and Tommy was reunited with his tearful parents. I watched from a distance, a sense of satisfaction mingled with the lingering unease. Sheriff Dale approached, clapping a hand on my shoulder. Good job, Jack, he said. You did good today. I nodded, but my mind was already elsewhere. There were more questions than answers, and I knew I couldn't leave it at that. Whispering pines had shown me a glimpse of its darkness, and I needed to uncover the truth. That night, as I lay in bed, the whispering haunted my dreams. I saw the creature's eyes, felt its presence, and heard its voice. It wasn't just a random encounter. It was a warning, a challenge, and I wasn't one to back down from a challenge. The following weeks were a blur of research and preparation. I pored over old maps, interviewed locals, and delved into the history of Whispering Pines. The more I learned, the deeper the mystery became. The forest had a long history of strange occurrences, dating back to the early settlers. People had gone missing, strange lights had been seen, and eerie sounds had been heard. The creature I encountered was just one of many entities that called the forest home. I decided to make another trip, this time more prepared. I enlisted the help of a few trusted friends, fellow cryptid hunters who had faced similar challenges. Together we planned a thorough exploration of Whispering Pines, determined to uncover its secrets. We set out early one morning, the sky overcast and the air heavy with the promise of rain. Our group consisted of five experienced hunters, each with their own specialty. There was Mike, a tracker with a keen eye for detail, Sarah, an expert in folklore and history, Dan, a survivalist who could navigate any terrain, and Laura, a tech wizard with all the latest gadgets. And then there was me, the leader, the one with the most experience in dealing with the unknown. We entered the forest with a sense of purpose, each step taking us deeper into the heart of the mystery. The atmosphere was tense, the whispering starting almost immediately. It was as if the forest itself was alive, aware of our presence. We followed the trail I had taken before, retracing my steps to the cabin. Along the way we found more signs of the creature's presence, claw marks on trees, more animal carcasses, and strange symbols carved into the bark. Sarah noted that the symbols matched those found in ancient texts, hinting at some kind of ritual or summoning. When we reached the cabin, we spread out, each of us taking a different area to investigate. Laura set up her equipment, sensors, and cameras to capture any anomalies. 
Mike and Dan scouted the perimeter, looking for tracks and other clues, while Sarah and I examined the inside. The basement was our main focus. We descended the stairs cautiously, the air growing colder with each step. The whispering was louder here, almost deafening. We could feel the presence of the creature lurking just out of sight. Sarah began to chant softly, an old protective spell she had learned from her studies. The air seemed to shimmer, the oppressive atmosphere lifting slightly. I scanned the room, my flashlight catching a glint of something in the corner. There, partially hidden by debris, was a book. Its cover was worn, the pages yellowed with age. I picked it up carefully, flipping through the pages. It was filled with strange symbols and drawings, diagrams of rituals and summoning circles. This was what we had been looking for, a key to understanding the creature and its connection to the forest. As I studied the book, a sense of dread settled over me. The rituals described were dark, twisted, requiring sacrifices and invoking ancient entities. The creature we had encountered was just one of many, a guardian or servant of something much more powerful. We regrouped, sharing our findings and formulating a plan. We needed to break the connection, to banish the entity and cleanse the forest. It would be dangerous, but we were prepared. That night we performed the ritual, each of us taking a role. The air was thick with tension, the whispering reaching a fever pitch. As we chanted, the ground shook, the air crackling with energy. The creature appeared, its form shifting and flickering, trying to break free of the circle we had drawn. It was a battle of wills, our determination against its malevolence. The air grew colder, the whispering louder, but we held firm. Finally, with a burst of light and a deafening roar, the creature was banished, the connection severed. The forest fell silent, the oppressive atmosphere lifting, we had done it. Whispering Pines was no longer a place of fear and darkness. As we packed up our gear and made our way back to the edge of the forest, I felt a sense of accomplishment. We had faced the unknown and emerged victorious. But I knew that this was just one victory in a larger battle. There were other places, other mysteries to uncover. As a cryptid hunter, my work was never done. The world was full of darkness and danger and it was my job to shine a light on it. And so, with a new sense of purpose, I prepared for the next challenge, ready to face whatever came my way. The whispering of whispering pines was silenced, but the echoes of its secrets would stay with me forever. My name is Aaron Mercer, and I have spent most of my life chasing shadows. In the late summer of 1995, I found myself driving through the dense woods of Pine Hollow, a small, forgotten town in the heart of the Midwest. My latest pursuit led me here, following whispers and rumors of strange sightings and unexplained disappearances. I never thought that this journey would end with me barely escaping with my life, with the haunting memories of what I encountered still fresh in my mind. The road to Pine Hollow was narrow and winding, flanked by towering trees that seemed to close in on me the further I drove. It felt like stepping back in time. The town had no modern amenities, no cell service, and barely any residents. It was the perfect breeding ground for the stories I chased, stories of the unexplained, the paranormal, and the supernatural. I arrived at the only inn in town, an old, creaky building with a faded sign that read, Pine Hollow Inn. The proprietor, an elderly woman named Mabel, greeted me with a smile that didn't quite reach her eyes. You're here about the disappearances, aren't you? She asked, her voice tinged with both curiosity and resignation. Yes, I replied, dropping my bag onto the worn wooden floor. I've heard some interesting stories about this place. Mabel nodded, her expression becoming grave. Be careful, Mr. Mercer. Pine Hollow has a way of getting under your skin. The First Night That night, as I lay in the lumpy bed, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. The room was silent except for the occasional creak of the old building settling and the rustling of leaves outside. I drifted into a restless sleep, plagued by dreams of dark figures moving through the woods. 
The next morning, I set out to gather information. The townsfolk were tight-lipped, offering little more than nervous glances and curt responses. It was clear that they were afraid, but of what, I wasn't sure. I decided to visit the local library, a dusty, forgotten place run by a middle-aged man named George. You're the first visitor we've had in months, George remarked as I flipped through old newspapers and records. People don't come to Pine Hollow anymore. Why not? I asked, already knowing the answer but hoping to get more details. Disappearances, George said quietly. People go into the woods and never come back. Some say it's the spirits of the forest. Others think it's something worse. As I continued my research, I found a pattern. Every few years, someone would vanish without a trace. The locals had their theories, but there were no concrete answers. I decided to investigate the latest disappearance, a young woman named Lily who had gone missing three months prior. Into the woods. Equipped with a map and my gear, I ventured into the woods where Lily was last seen. The forest was dense, the canopy blocking out most of the sunlight, casting eerie shadows on the forest floor. The further I walked, the more oppressive the atmosphere became. It felt as though the woods were alive, watching my every move. After a few hours, I stumbled upon a clearing with an old, dilapidated cabin. The door hung loosely on its hinges, and the windows were shattered. It looked abandoned, but something compelled me to investigate. Inside, I found remnants of someone's life. Clothes, photographs, and personal items strewn about as if they had left in a hurry. As I rummaged through the debris, I found Lily's diary. Her last entry sent chills down my spine. Something is out there. I can feel it watching me. I don't know what it wants, but I know it's coming for me. I decided to spend the night in the cabin, hoping to find more clues. As darkness fell, the forest came alive with sounds, twigs snapping, leaves rustling, and an occasional distant howl. I felt an overwhelming sense of dread, but I was determined to uncover the truth. The Entity Around midnight I was jolted awake by a noise outside. Peering through the cracked window, I saw a figure standing at the edge of the clearing. It was tall and thin, with glowing eyes that seemed to pierce through the darkness. My heart pounded in my chest as I watched it move closer, its movements slow and deliberate. I grabbed my flashlight and stepped outside, my hands trembling. Who's there? I called out, my voice barely more than a whisper. The figure stopped, its eyes fixed on me. For a moment, I was paralyzed with fear. Then, as if deciding I wasn't worth the trouble, it turned and disappeared into the woods. I stood there for what felt like an eternity, trying to make sense of what I had just seen. Was it a ghost, a demon, or something else entirely? The next morning, I returned to town, shaken but resolute. I needed more information, more pieces of the puzzle. Mabel greeted me with a knowing look as I entered the inn. You saw it, didn't you? She asked. I nodded. What is it? Mabel sighed and sat down across from me. It's an old legend. Some say it's a guardian of the forest. Others believe it's a cursed spirit. Whatever it is, it's been here for as long as anyone can remember. And it's not alone. The lost, determined to find out more, I sought out the oldest resident of Pine Hollow, an elderly man named Samuel. He lived on the outskirts of town, in a small, weathered house surrounded by overgrown vegetation. Samuel was reluctant to talk at first, but after some coaxing, he began to share his story. I was a boy when it first happened, he said, his voice raspy with age. People started disappearing, and those who went looking for them never came back. My father was one of them. Samuel described the entity as a manifestation of the forest's anger, a protector of something ancient and powerful. It's not just one spirit, he explained. There are many and they feed off the fear and pain of their victims. Armed with this new information, I decided to venture deeper into the woods, hoping to find the source of these entities. I knew it was dangerous, but I had come too far to turn back now. The Confrontation Two days later, I found myself deep in the heart of the forest, 
far from any signs of civilization. The air was thick with an unearthly silence, broken only by the occasional rustling of leaves. I followed a narrow path that seemed to lead nowhere, driven by an inexplicable force. Eventually I came upon a large, ancient tree with gnarled roots and a hollow trunk. The air around it felt charged with energy, and I knew I had found the source. As I approached, a figure emerged from the shadows. It was the same entity I had seen before, but now there were more. Dozens of glowing eyes staring at me from the darkness. My mind raced as I tried to figure out what to do. I knew I couldn't fight them, and running seemed futile. Instead, I spoke to them, my voice trembling. What do you want? For a moment, there was only silence. Then, a voice echoed in my mind, cold and distant. Leave this place. You do not belong here. I nodded, slowly backing away. I understand. I just want to know what happened to the people who disappeared. The entity seemed to consider my request. They are lost to the forest, taken by us to protect what lies within. Leave now, and you will not share their fate. I didn't need to be told twice. I turned and ran, not stopping until I was back at the edge of the forest. The sun was setting, casting long shadows across the ground. But I didn't feel safe until I was back at the inn. The Escape I left Pine Hollow the next morning, the weight of what I had experienced heavy on my shoulders. As I drove away, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, that the entities were still out there, waiting. I knew I would never return to that place, and I warned others to stay away. In the years that followed, I continued my work as a cryptid hunter, but Pine Hollow remained a dark chapter in my life, a reminder of the dangers that lurk in the shadows. I still have nightmares about the glowing eyes and the cold voice that echoed in my mind. And sometimes, when I'm alone in the woods, I swear I can feel them watching me, waiting for me to return. The stories I tell now are tinged with a warning, a reminder that some mysteries are better left unsolved. Pine Hollow remains a place shrouded in darkness, a testament to the power of the unknown. And I, Aaron Mercer, will carry its secrets with me to my grave, haunted by the knowledge that some doors should never be opened. It was a crisp October morning in 1985, and the fog clung to the dense woods like a ghostly veil. I had been chasing cryptids for years, weaving through the labyrinthine forests of America, documenting sightings and gathering evidence of creatures that science refused to acknowledge. My name is Daniel Foster, and this is my story. I found myself in a small town in northern Maine, a place so secluded that it seemed to exist outside of time. The locals whispered about a series of disappearances stretching back decades, all centered around the thick forest that bordered the town. They spoke of an ancient evil, something not quite human, that lived within the woods. My curiosity was piqued, and I decided to investigate. I rented a small cabin on the outskirts of town, close enough to the forest that I could begin my search at dawn. The town itself was quaint, with a single main street lined with a general store, a diner, and a few other nondescript buildings. The townsfolk eyed me warily their suspicions evident. Outsiders rarely ventured here, and those who did were seldom seen again. The first few days were uneventful. I spent my time mapping the area, noting any peculiarities or signs of unusual activity. Each night I would return to the cabin, poring over my notes and planning the next day's route. It was on the fourth day that I stumbled upon something truly disturbing. The sun was setting, casting long shadows through the trees. I had ventured deeper into the forest than usual when I came across a clearing. In the center stood a dilapidated cabin, its wooden beams rotting and overgrown with ivy. It looked as if it had been abandoned for years. As I approached, I noticed strange symbols carved into the doorframe, symbols that I didn't recognize but that filled me with an inexplicable sense of dread. I pushed open the door, and it creaked loudly, the sound echoing through the empty woods. Inside, the air was stale, and the floor was covered in a thick layer of dust. The walls were adorned with more of those strange symbols. 
and in the corner of the room lay a small, weathered journal. I picked it up and began to read. The journal belonged to a man named Harold Whitaker, who had lived in the cabin with his family in the early 1900s. His entries spoke of strange occurrences, voices in the night, shadows that moved on their own, and an ever-present feeling of being watched. As I read further, the entries became more frantic, detailing the disappearance of his wife and children and his desperate attempts to find them. The final entry was scrawled in a shaky hand. It is here. It knows I am alone. I can hear it outside, scratching at the door. I fear this may be my last night. If anyone finds this, know that there is something in these woods. Something ancient and evil. I pocketed the journal and quickly left the cabin, my mind racing with questions. As I made my way back through the forest, the sun dipped below the horizon and darkness enveloped the trees. The once familiar path seemed to twist and turn, and I soon realized I was lost. Panic set in as I wandered aimlessly, the sounds of the forest growing louder and more menacing. I could hear twigs snapping behind me, but whenever I turned, there was nothing there. The oppressive darkness pressed in from all sides, and I began to fear that I would never find my way out. Just as I was about to give up hope, I saw a faint light in the distance. I stumbled toward it, my heart pounding in my chest. The light grew brighter, and I found myself at the edge of another clearing. In the center stood a tall, imposing figure, its eyes glowing a sickly yellow. I froze, unable to move as the figure began to speak. Its voice was deep and resonant, like the rumble of distant thunder. You should not have come here, it said. This place is cursed, and now you are part of it. I managed to find my voice, though it was barely more than a whisper. Who are you? What do you want? The figure stepped closer, and I could see its face more clearly. It was a man, or at least it had been once. His skin was pale and gaunt, stretched tightly over his bones. His eyes burned with an unnatural light, and his smile was cold and cruel. I am the guardian of these woods, he said, and you are trespassing. I took a step back, my mind racing. I'm just looking for answers, I said. I want to know what happened to the people who disappeared. The guardian laughed, a hollow, mirthless sound. They are lost as you will be, he said. These woods are a prison and I am its warden. There is no escape. With that he vanished, leaving me alone in the clearing. The light faded and darkness returned. I felt a chill run down my spine as I realized the gravity of my situation. I was trapped, and there was no one who could help me. I spent the next few days trying to find a way out of the forest, but it seemed to stretch on endlessly. The trees twisted and turned, creating an impenetrable maze. I rationed my supplies, but they quickly ran out, and I was forced to rely on my survival skills to find food and water. Each night, I could hear the Guardian's voice echoing through the trees, taunting me. You cannot escape, he would say. You are mine. One night, as I huddled by a small fire, I heard footsteps approaching. I grabbed a branch and held it out like a weapon, ready to defend myself. To my surprise, a young woman stepped into the light. She was dirty and disheveled, her clothes torn and her eyes wide with fear. Who are you? I asked lowering the branch slightly. My name is Sarah, she said, her voice trembling. I got lost in these woods weeks ago. I've been trying to find a way out, but it's hopeless. I felt a surge of relief at the sight of another human being. I'm Daniel, I said. I'm a cryptid hunter. I came here to investigate the disappearances. Sarah nodded, her eyes darting around nervously. There's something in these woods, she said. Something evil. I've seen it. It took my friends. I gestured for her to sit by the fire, and she gratefully accepted. Tell me everything, I said. Maybe together we can find a way out. Over the next few hours, Sarah recounted her harrowing experience. She and a group of friends had come to the forest for a camping trip, but one by one, they had disappeared. She described a shadowy figure that stalked them, its eyes glowing in the darkness. It had taken her friends and she had been on the run ever since. As she spoke, I realized that her story matched the accounts in Harold Whitaker's journal. The Guardian was real, and he was hunting us. 
we had to find a way to break the curse and escape the forest. The next day we set out together, determined to find answers. We retraced my steps to the abandoned cabin, hoping to uncover more clues. Inside we found an old map tucked into a drawer. It was faded and worn, but it showed a series of markings that corresponded to the strange symbols on the walls. We followed the map deeper into the forest, the terrain growing more treacherous with each step. The air grew colder, and an eerie silence settled over the woods. We finally reached a clearing, at the center of which stood a massive, ancient tree. Its gnarled branches stretched toward the sky like twisted fingers, and the ground around it was littered with bones. This must be it, I said, my voice barely more than a whisper. The heart of the curse. Sarah and I approached the tree cautiously, our eyes scanning the area for any sign of danger. As we drew closer, we saw that the symbols from the cabin were carved into the trunk of the tree, their lines glowing faintly in the dim light. We need to destroy it, Sarah said, her voice firm. It's the only way to break the curse. I nodded in agreement and pulled a small hatchet from my pack. As I raised it to strike, a cold wind swept through the clearing, and the guardian's voice boomed from the shadows. You cannot destroy me, he said. I am eternal. Ignoring his words, I swung the hatchet with all my strength, embedding it deep into the tree's trunk. The symbols flared brightly, and the ground shook violently. The guardian appeared before us, his eyes blazing with fury. You will pay for this, he snarled, advancing toward us. Sarah and I stood our ground, determined to finish what we had started. I struck the tree again and again, each blow weakening the guardian's hold on the forest. As the final blow landed, the symbols shattered, and the Guardian let out a deafening roar. The ground beneath us split open, and the Guardian was swallowed by the earth, his screams echoing through the forest. The ancient tree began to wither and die, its branches falling away and turning to dust. The curse was broken. Sarah and I stood in silence, watching as the forest seemed to come alive with new energy. The oppressive darkness lifted, and the sun broke through the canopy, bathing the clearing in warm light. We made our way back to town, our spirits lifted by the knowledge that we had freed the forest from its ancient evil. The townsfolk welcomed us with open arms, their fear replaced by gratitude. In the years that followed, the forest flourished, and the disappearances ceased. Sarah and I became close friends, bonded by our shared experience. We continued our work, investigating other mysteries and uncovering the truth behind the legends. But I will never forget that October in Maine, when I came face to face with an ancient evil and lived to tell the tale. When I first started hunting cryptids, I never thought it would lead me to such a dark place. You see, I wasn't always a hunter. I used to be a cop in a small town in the Midwest. My name's Cal, short for Callahan, but nobody calls me that. They just call me Cal. I left the force after my partner Mike went missing on a routine patrol. We found his car, lights still flashing, but no Mike. It was like he just vanished into thin air. That was ten years ago. I had to do something to make sense of it all, so I turned to the world of cryptids. Mike was always fascinated by those stories. Bigfoot, Mothman, the Jersey Devil. He'd talk about them like they were real. And after he disappeared, I started to believe he might have been on to something. I began investigating strange disappearances and sightings, hoping to find some clue about what happened to him. That's what led me to the small town of Pine Hollow, nestled deep in the Ozarks. Pine Hollow wasn't on any map, not officially. It was the kind of place you'd hear about in hushed tones a place where people went missing and nobody asked questions. I had gotten a tip from a fellow hunter about a string of disappearances in the area. Folks said the forest around Pine Hollow was haunted, cursed even. I arrived in Pine Hollow on a chilly October evening. The town was exactly what you'd expect. A main street with a diner, a gas station, and a few run-down buildings. The locals didn't take kindly to strangers, and I got more than a few suspicious glances as I checked into the only motel. The receptionist, a woman in her sixties with a permanent scowl, handed me the key without a word. My room was as depressing as the town itself. Faded wallpaper, a sagging bed, 
and a flickering TV. I threw my bag on the bed and sat down, pulling out my notebook. I had a list of names, people who had gone missing in Pine Hollow over the past decade. There were eight in total, ranging from a teenage girl to an elderly man. All had vanished without a trace. The most recent disappearance was just two weeks ago, a local named Jake Sullivan. I decided to start my investigation at the diner. Places like that were gold mines for information. People talked over coffee and pie, and if you listened long enough, you could piece together the town's secrets. I walked in, and the smell of frying bacon and stale coffee hit me. A few heads turned, but most people kept to themselves. I took a seat at the counter and ordered a coffee. The waitress, a woman in her forties with tired eyes and a name tag that read Marge, poured me a cup. You're not from around here, she said, not really a question. Nope, I replied, just passing through. She raised an eyebrow but didn't press further. I sipped my coffee, glancing around. There was a group of old men playing cards in the corner, a young couple in a booth by the window, and a lone man at the far end of the counter. He looked out of place, clean cut, wearing a suit. Not the kind of attire you'd expect in a town like Pine Hollow. Marge caught me looking and leaned in. That's Reverend Davis, she whispered. He's been here a few months. Strange fella, if you ask me. I nodded, making a mental note to talk to him later. What can you tell me about Jake Sullivan? I asked. Marge stiffened. Jake? He's missing, you know. I heard. Any idea what happened to him? She shook her head. No one does. One day he was here, the next he was gone. Just like the others. The others? She leaned in closer, her voice dropping to a whisper. Folks say the forest takes him. I don't know about that. But I do know people don't just disappear without a reason. I thanked her for the coffee and left a generous tip. As I walked out, I noticed Reverend Davis watching me. Our eyes met and he gave me a nod. I returned it and stepped outside. The sun was setting casting long shadows over the town. I decided to take a walk, get a feel for the place. The forest loomed at the edge of town, dark and foreboding. I found myself drawn to it, like a moth to a flame. The trees were dense, their branches intertwining to form a canopy that blocked out most of the light. I stepped off the road and into the woods, the underbrush crunching beneath my boots. I walked for what felt like hours, the town fading away behind me. The deeper I went, the darker it got. I felt a chill run down my spine, but I pushed it aside. I had to find answers. That's when I heard it. A rustling in the bushes, followed by a low growl. My heart raced as I turned, my hand instinctively reaching for the knife at my belt. A figure stepped out from the shadows. It was a man, or at least it had been. His skin was pale, his eyes sunken and lifeless. He moved with a jerky, unnatural gait, like a puppet on strings. Who are you? I demanded, my voice steady despite the fear coursing through me. The man didn't respond. Instead, he lunged at me, his fingers curled into claws. I dodged to the side, slashing with my knife. The blade bit into his arm, but he didn't seem to notice. He came at me again, and this time I didn't hesitate. I drove the knife into his chest, right where the heart should be. He let out a gurgling gasp and fell to the ground motionless. I stood there, panting, my mind racing. What the hell was that? I looked down at the body, half expecting it to get back up. But it didn't. I knelt down, examining the man. His skin was cold to the touch, and there was a strange symbol carved into his forehead, a circle with a cross through it. I took a step back, trying to make sense of it all. That's when I heard a voice behind me. You shouldn't be here. I spun around, my knife at the ready. Reverend Davis stood there, his expression unreadable. What the hell is going on? I demanded. He sighed, stepping closer. You've stumbled onto something you don't understand, Cal. How do you know my name? I know a lot of things, he replied. But right now you need to come with me. It's not safe here. I hesitated, but the look in his eyes convinced me to follow. We walked in silence, the forest pressing in around us. After what felt like an eternity, we emerged into a clearing. A small cabin stood in the center, smoke curling from its chimney. Davis led me inside where a fire crackled in the hearth. 
The cabin was sparsely furnished, a table, a couple of chairs, and a bed in the corner. He motioned for me to sit, and I did, my mind still reeling. What was that thing? I asked. He sat across from me, his expression grim. That was a white, a creature born of dark magic and death. They're drawn to this place, to the forest. Why? He shook his head. I don't know, but I've been trying to stop them. Why didn't you tell anyone? Who would believe me? He replied. People would think I'm crazy, and maybe I am. But I couldn't just sit by and do nothing. I leaned back, processing his words. So what now? Now we wait, he said. The whites don't usually come out during the day. We'll be safe here for the night. I nodded, though I wasn't entirely convinced. We sat in silence for a while, the only sound the crackling of the fire. Eventually, exhaustion caught up with me, and I fell into a restless sleep. I awoke to the sound of birds chirping. Sunlight streamed through the window, dispelling the shadows that had haunted me the night before. I sat up, rubbing my eyes. Davis was already up, making breakfast. Morning, he said, handing me a plate of eggs and bacon. Morning, I replied, taking the plate. Thanks. We ate in silence, each lost in our own thoughts. After breakfast, Davis cleared his throat. We need to go back, he said, to the spot where you found the white. There might be clues there. I nodded, finishing my coffee. We gathered our things and set out, retracing my steps from the previous night. The forest didn't seem as menacing in the daylight, but there was still an eerie silence that hung over everything. When we reached the spot, the body was gone. All that remained was a patch of disturbed earth and a faint smell of decay. Davis knelt down, examining the ground. They usually take the bodies, he said, to their lair. Where's that? He pointed deeper into the forest. There's an old mine a few miles from here. I've never been inside, but I suspect that's where they're hiding. Then that's where we're going, I said, determination fueling my steps. The hike to the mine was grueling, the terrain was rough, and the air grew colder the deeper we went. After what felt like hours, we reached the entrance, a gaping hole in the side of a hill, shrouded in darkness. Davis handed me a flashlight. Stay close, he said, and be ready for anything. We entered the mine, the beam of my flashlight cutting through the darkness. The air was thick with dust, and the sound of our footsteps echoed off the walls. As we ventured deeper, I felt a growing sense of dread. Something was watching us. I was sure of it. We reached a large chamber, and I froze. The walls were covered in strange symbols, similar to the one I'd seen on the white's forehead. In the center of the room was an altar, and on it lay the body of a young woman. I recognized her from the missing persons reports. Emily Thompson, a local who had vanished a month ago. I approached the altar, my heart pounding. Emily? She didn't move. I checked her pulse, but there was nothing. She was cold, lifeless. I looked around, but there was no sign of the whites. It was as if they had vanished. Davis joined me, his expression grim. We need to get out of here, he said. Now. We turned to leave, but the way was blocked. A group of whites stood there, their lifeless eyes fixed on us. I drew my knife, ready to fight, but Davis grabbed my arm. Run, he said. I'll hold them off. What? No, we can take them together. He shook his head. You need to get out of here. Find help. I'll buy you time. I wanted to argue, but there was no time. The whites were closing in, and Davis was already moving to intercept them. I took a deep breath and ran, my heart hammering in my chest. I didn't stop until I was out of the mine and back in the forest. I stumbled through the trees, my mind racing. I needed to find help, to tell someone what was happening. But who would believe me? I reached the edge of the forest, and the town of Pine Hollow came into view. I ran to the diner, bursting through the door. Marge looked up, startled. Cal? What's wrong? Call the police, I gasped. Now. She didn't hesitate, grabbing the phone and dialing. I collapsed into a chair, trying to catch my breath. The police arrived within minutes, and I told them everything. They looked skeptical, but they agreed to check the mine. I waited at the diner, my mind racing. Hours passed, 
And finally, the officers returned. They looked shaken. We found the bodies, one of them said. Just like you said. But there's no sign of Reverend Davis. I felt a pang of guilt. He had sacrificed himself to save me, and now he was gone. But at least the truth was out. The people of Pine Hollow would know what was lurking in their forest. I left the town the next day, my mind heavy with the events that had transpired. I didn't find Mike, but I had uncovered something far darker, and I knew I couldn't stop. There were more mysteries out there, more people who needed help, so I kept hunting, kept searching, because sometimes the only way to find the truth is to face the darkness head on, and maybe, just maybe, I'd find the answers I was looking for. It was 1995, and I was deep into my career as a cryptid hunter. Most people scoff at the idea, but there's a dedicated community out there that's convinced there's more to this world than what we see on the surface. My name's Jake Randall, and I've seen things that would curl your hair. This story starts in a tiny, off-the-map town in the Pacific Northwest. Let's call it Pine Hollow. Pine Hollow is one of those places you drive through on your way to somewhere else, blink, and you've missed it. But it had a reputation among cryptid enthusiasts. Whispers of strange sightings, unexplained disappearances, and an air of dread that clung to the place like fog. I got a tip from a fellow hunter named Liz. She had been tracking a series of unusual events, missing pets, mutilated livestock, and a couple of hikers who vanished without a trace. Liz and I had worked together before, and she trusted my instincts as much as I trusted hers. She said she felt something was different about Pine Hollow, something that got under her skin. I packed my gear, night vision goggles, a couple of reliable cameras, a sturdy knife, and my dad's old .357 Magnum. I didn't expect to use the gun, but in our line of work, it's better to be prepared. I also had a digital voice recorder, which I used to document everything. Liz had given me the coordinates of a particular spot where she felt the presence was strongest, a place called Deepwood Forest. The town itself was eerily quiet when I arrived. It was late afternoon, but the sky was already dimming under a thick layer of clouds. I checked into a rundown motel, the kind with peeling wallpaper and an unsettling smell that you couldn't quite place. The owner, an old man with a face like leather, eyed me with a mixture of suspicion and curiosity. Here for the fishing? He asked, not sounding convinced. Something like that, I replied, keeping it vague. No point in stirring up the locals. The first night I decided to do a bit of reconnaissance. Deepwood Forest wasn't far from the motel, so I grabbed my gear and set out just as the sun dipped below the horizon. The forest was dense, with towering pines that blocked out what little light the moon provided. As I ventured deeper, the sounds of the town faded away, replaced by the whispers of the wind through the trees and the occasional rustle of unseen animals. I reached the coordinates Liz had given me, a small clearing surrounded by an almost perfect circle of ancient trees. It felt... off. There was a heavy, oppressive silence that made my skin prickle. I set up a couple of motion-activated cameras around the perimeter and settled in to wait. Hours passed, and the forest remained unnervingly quiet. Then, just past midnight, I heard it a faint distant scream that echoed through the trees. It was quickly followed by another, closer this time. I strained to see through the darkness, but my flashlight revealed nothing beyond the immediate vicinity. My heart pounded in my chest as I tried to pinpoint the direction of the screams. They were human, filled with a terror that chilled me to the bone. The next day I met Liz at a diner on the edge of town. She looked tired, dark circles under her eyes betraying a lack of sleep. We exchanged updates, and I told her about the screams. That's what I was afraid of, she said, her voice barely above a whisper. There's something out there, Jake, something that's hunting people. We decided to go back to Deepwood Forest that night, this time better prepared. Liz brought along some extra gear, including a high-powered rifle and more sophisticated recording equipment. As we set up camp in the clearing, the atmosphere was tense. We didn't talk much both of us lost in our thoughts. Around midnight, the forest came alive with sounds, 
twigs snapping, leaves rustling, and that same eerie silence that seemed to creep in and out like a living thing. We stayed alert, scanning the darkness with our night vision goggles. It wasn't long before we saw it. A figure, tall and gaunt, moving between the trees with an unnatural grace. It was humanoid, but something about it was all wrong. Its limbs were too long, its movements too fluid. Liz and I watched in stunned silence as it circled the clearing, never stepping into the light but always watching us. What the hell is that? Liz whispered, her voice shaking. I don't know, I replied, my hand gripping the handle of my knife. But it's not human. The creature continued to circle us, its eyes glowing with a faint, eerie light. It didn't make a sound, but its presence was suffocating. Then, without warning, it lunged forward, faster than anything I'd ever seen. Liz fired her rifle, the shot echoing through the forest, but it barely slowed the thing down. We fought it off as best we could, but it was like trying to fight a shadow. Every time we thought we had it cornered, it would slip away, only to reappear from another direction. Finally, in a desperate move, I grabbed the digital voice recorder and started playing back the screams from the night before. The creature froze, its glowing eyes fixed on the device. For a moment it seemed almost confused, as if it recognized the sounds. Then, with a guttural snarl, it turned and fled into the darkness, disappearing as quickly as it had appeared. Liz and I didn't waste any time. We packed up our gear and got out of there, not stopping until we were back at the motel. We spent the rest of the night poring over the footage from the cameras. The recordings showed the creature, but every time it got close the image would distort, making it impossible to get a clear look. We decided to take the evidence to the local authorities, but when we arrived at the sheriff's office the next morning, we were met with disbelief. The sheriff, a grizzled man named Carter, listened to our story with a skeptical frown. You two been out in the woods too long, he said, shaking his head. There ain't no such thing as monsters. We left the office frustrated and angry. It was clear we were on our own. Over the next few days, we tried to gather more information, talking to the townsfolk and exploring other parts of the forest. But the more we dug, the more we realized that whatever was happening in Pine Hollow was something the locals preferred to ignore. Then, one evening, Liz went missing. We had split up to cover more ground, and she was supposed to check in every hour. When I didn't hear from her, I knew something was wrong. I searched the forest for hours, calling her name, but there was no sign of her. Desperate, I went back to the clearing and played the recording again, hoping to draw the creature out. It worked. The figure appeared, moving between the trees, its glowing eyes fixed on me. This time I didn't run. I stood my ground, holding the voice recorder out like a talisman. Where's Liz? I shouted, my voice echoing through the forest. What did you do with her? The creature tilted its head, almost as if it were considering my words. Then, in a voice that sounded like a chorus of whispers, it spoke. She is ours now. I felt a cold wave of fear wash over me, but I couldn't back down. What do you want? The creature took a step closer, its eyes glowing brighter. To feed, to grow, to be. Before I could react, it lunged at me, but this time I was ready. I fired the point .357 Magnum, the shot ringing out like a thunderclap. The creature shrieked, a sound that pierced the night, and then it was gone, melting back into the shadows. I never found Liz. The authorities wrote her off as another lost hiker and the case was closed. But I knew better. Whatever that thing was, it was still out there, lurking in the darkness, waiting for its next victim. I left Pine Hollow not long after that, but the memories stayed with me. I've faced a lot of strange things in my career, but nothing like that. And as much as I try to forget, I can still hear those whispers in the back of my mind, reminding me that some mysteries are better left unsolved. Years later, I still hunt cryptids, but I'm more careful now. I've learned that there are things in this world that defy explanation, things that can't be fought with guns or knives. Sometimes the best you can do is survive and tell the story, hoping that someone somewhere will believe you. And so I tell this story, not for fame or recognition, but as a warning. If you ever find yourself in a place like Pine Hollow, where the air is thick with secrets and the shadows seem to move on their own, be careful. Because out there in the darkness, 
Something is always watching, always waiting. And it's hungry. <laughs>